time has come to stop now. There's no doubt in my mind that, it, you know, that there'll be a fight. I also had my office, because I'm a lawyer, had it swept to make sure there was no bugs in the room. Outrage over the defiant boss of Canada's largest police union. Is Craig Bramell a law unto himself? But if you found somebody that's an enemy of the police, uh, we don't want him around. So you try and get him kicked out of office. Pretty simple. Tonight, Victor Malarek and the investigation that unleashed the storm of controversy surrounding Craig Bramell and his war against his critics. If you're intimidating elected officials, what would you do to the average citizen out there? New revelations about how far Bramell's campaign of intimidation has gone. Do you fear Craig Bramell? Yes. The Fifth Estate with Lyndon McIntyre, Francine Peltier, and Victor Malarek. Good evening and welcome to the Fifth Estate. Toronto has never seen anything like it. An unprecedented outpouring of anger directed at a single man, Craig Bramell, head of the city's powerful police union. The politicians, the public, even police bosses virtually all agree. Craig Bramell must be stopped. The immediate cause of furor is Operation True Blue, a union campaign to raise funds that critics fear will be used to target its opponents. Those fears are given substance by remarks Bramell made on this program two months ago. In it, he talked openly about using threats, intimidation, and even dirt gathered by private investigators to silence the union's critics. Yet despite the uproar, Bramell remains defiantly on a collision course with his civilian masters. If he succeeds, the face of policing in Canada could be changed. Other police forces are closely watching the outcome of this power struggle, ready to copy his methods. Tonight, the Fifth Estate revisits its profile of Craig Bramell and new revelations about how far he's prepared to go. The message from the police association has been very clear. If you're a politician and you criticize us, we will investigate. And that's what Bob It's one of the biggest political controversies in Toronto in decades. I am quite right. The militant police union leader, Craig Bramell, taking on the whole city. Bramell's a bully. He's a man whose entire career has been built on battling authority. We need a big dog. Because there's big dogs that come after us. October 1992, angry police officers march on the Ontario legislature to protest tough new rules on drawing their guns. The protest was spearheaded by Craig Bramell, then a disgruntled constable with an extreme dislike for accountability. What I was worried about was that the hesitation was going to sit in. Like, I'm not going to pull my gun out because I, I got to fill out this damn report. The government caved in and that constable went on to become the leader of the most powerful police union in Canada. Intimidation works, and it's a lesson Craig Brumell has never forgotten. Well, I went to Queen's Park and just reminded what happened in 1992. <laughs> <laughs> the inevitable result of a union running a police department is that you'll get police corruption and brutality and the citizens lose out. Craig Bramell told me that politicians who criticize the police are scumbags. If there's a scumbag around, it's Mr. Bramell, without question. He makes me furious with his attitude and the approach that he uses to try to intimidate people and push them around. You've been called dangerous, a thug, a bully. You can call me a bully. Is noon still a deadline? Well, like I said, we're going to have to evaluate as the hours go by, and uh, you can all go home if you want. <laughs> <laughs> like it or not, Craig Bramell is the new face of policing. His mission is simple, to serve and protect the 7,000 men and women of the Toronto Police Force, and he's happy to play hardball. Ricky, we'll be back in five minutes or two hours. Okay. September 1999, the union is negotiating a new contract with the head of the police board, Norm Gardner. Bromell threatens an illegal strike if the cops don't get what they want. Is the job action on hold? Is the job action on hold? We're holding our uh, the troops back on the job action, so... Uh, Craig, I still want to know, did your threats work? Well, when you do something like that, you expect it to work. Um, that's why we do it. Uh, I believe people were taking this very serious, and they should have. 
Norm, you're, you have no concern at all that the perception will be the union barked and the police board blinked because of the threats? Well, you know, people can, you know, some people may want to come to that conclusion. Bromel started out as a street cop. 51 Division was his home base for 18 years, and even now, he's still considered one of the guys. Who you looking at? The gold rule that which he operates okay. by is just, hey, if it's good for the men and women of this service, then it's good for me because that's what we're going to be doing. And he doesn't have any personal agendas that I can see, and I, you got to respect that. Bromel's old stomping ground sits smack in the heart of the toughest part of downtown Toronto. Fort Apache it was the punishment division. You know, officers would mess up or they'd be in trouble. They always sent them down to 51 Division. But when they got down here, and I learned very quickly, you had to survive, you had to stick together to survive, and... Uh, you had no choice in the matter. To survive in this punishment division, you have to be tough. And Bromel was. But in 18 years, he never rose above the rank of constable. I first started down here. There was a night that we didn't go by. You were involved in a fight of some kind. And uh, you got to learn quick. I mean, it's like my job now. It's all on the job training. I mean, you get down here, you know, you throw the books away from police college and, you know, you can have all the techniques you want, but it turns into dirty fighting. I mean, if you're losing, kick the guy in the groin and worry about the paperwork later. That's the attitude that happened. It was like us against them. And that kind of attitude didn't help Bromel. In August 1996, he and eight of his fellow officers were accused of dishing out their own brand of vigilante justice. Anybody have anything to say? I suffer every night from what they did to me. I get my nightmares, my pain in my head, pain in my back, the scars. Thomas Kerr broke a policeman's arm in a scuffle. He says that two weeks later, he was picked up, put in a cell for two hours, and then taken out the back door of the police station to a waiting cruiser. Did they take you home? No, they did not. Where did they take you? They took me for a little stroll down to Cherry Beach. I'm saying, well, what's going on? He goes, well, shut the fuck up. We just want to talk to you. So he goes along Cherry Beach. And moments after, another cruiser drove up with four police officers in the car. But a minute or two afterwards, another cruiser come with four more. I'm going, well, something's not right here because they're starting to put on gloves. Sure enough, the door flies open, and they pull me out. And then they start punching and kicking at me, and they're throwing bottles at me and smashing me with all they have, their billy clubs, and they're laughing. Now we're going to get you, they keep saying. Now we got you. It was all based on the ravings of a completely unreliable complainant, one who has a track record of... Uh, as it turns out, of uh, making false allegations against the police, so... It, you know, sometimes if the judge finds out that he's got all these other charges, it's bad news. Gary Cluley, a former prosecutor, was hired to defend the nine policemen when Internal Affairs launched an investigation into Kerr's complaint, and he would later become Bromel's right-hand man. They interviewed hundreds of people, they wiretapped my clients, they followed them around. I mean, uh, they got more attention than Al Capone. You and a number of your colleagues are accused of beating up the suspect in a deserted part of town. A serious allegation. It was a serious allegation, but we've had m more serious allegations that have happened to officers here that didn't lead into a, uh, you know, thousands of dollars worth of investigations and, and, and manpower it was incredible. I mean, I, I believe the entire office of internal affairs at one time was assigned to this case. But the end result also was that internal affairs didn't buy your version. Well, they haven't bought versions before, and they've laid charges against officers, so I don't buy that one bit. Um, I think what happened was it ruined nine lives. It was a messy scandal. Key evidence was tampered with. 51 Division was under siege. But in the end, it all came down to the word of one drifter against nine police officers. There was evidence against the men, but not enough to get a conviction. I am advised that after considerable deliberations and consultations between investigators of my office 
and senior counsel at the Crown Law Office Criminal Division. There is no reasonable prospect of a conviction in this matter. The public was told that the nine officers were essentially guilty, but they just couldn't prove it. I mean, it's one thing to get investigated and exonerated. It's another thing to get investigated and exonerated and have the world be advised that you're guilty anyway. I saw how easy it was for officers to be treated wrongly, and I wanted to make sure it just never happened again, and or do my best to make sure it didn't happen again. And one way was to run the union. <clears throat> and